Um, it's a great way to promote science and scientists. Uh, it's also a way to get public engagement. You get huge leverage uh, through the prize uh, format. So we launched that four years ago. Um, the scientists are working on it. Um, but an amazing thing happened. The National Academy of Sciences, which represents National Academy, of, National Academy, National Academy of Medicine, which represents the 800-pound gorilla of science. Uh, the president is Victor Zhao, and uh, you know he came to me at one point and said, "You know what? We should do this at the national level." I'm like, "Victor, that's crazy. You represent the establishment. This is that will be amazing." Um, so you know, I don't think we can afford not to do this, right? I mean, we can't afford to do it, but we can't afford not to do it. Um, so we had a series of conversations the last two years. Uh, he came out and spoke, and I went to the National Academy and spoke at the annual meeting. He came out again, addressed the board, we had an exchange of letters over the summer, and uh, the last letter he sent me, you know, left me, my hands were shaking, because, you know, we're gonna do this at the National Academy level. So the, uh, the Powell Prize, uh, Longevity Prize, has now been transformed into the National Academy of Medicine, Aging and Longevity Grand Challenge, uh, thank you. Um, and it's going to be spearheaded by Tachi Yamada, uh, who ran Global uh, Challenges for the Gates Family, and by Bob Horowitz, who's the other Nobel Laureate uh, in aging research. Unbelievable. Now we have the A-team that we can fund. Unbelievable, right? So uh, I learned from Tim Draper to be the first volunteer, so uh, Kimberly and I pitched in two million to get that initiative going. So I'm here to announce that to all of you, our public service announcement. I heard somebody's already matched us for two million, so I hope that's true. Um, I really appreciate that, somebody that, uh, uh, that heard about it. So in addition to um, the funding, that, uh, which is a great way to reward scientists, and get further public engagement. Um, you get huge leverage for uh, making these kind of pledges. Um, we decided we're also gonna donate our aging patents to the field, um, not exclusively, so everybody's got uh, the freedom to operate. Uh, you know, prizes are great in that they encourage collaboration, um, but I think IP, I mean, Kevin's here who represents IP on the tech side, uh, and it's kind of crazy how it actually, in some ways, even though it encourages innovation, it can also get in the way of innovation, so we just figure it's easier if we just put it into the field, so, pe so it's a public good and people can all run with this. So we're also gonna donate that IP, and uh, with that in mind, I would like to invite Nicole up to the stage. Thank you. Yeah. All right, can you hear me? Okay. Well, thank you. It's nice to see you all here today. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the patent system. So the patent system was first developed in 1790 to promote the progress of the useful arts. Its drafters at that time could not have anticipated the complexity of the technologies of today. You know, in fact, the first failure of the patent system came in the 1850s with this complex device, um, the sewing machine. No one party could create a sewing machine without infringing on the patent of another. This led to, to what became known as the sewing machine wars, where corporations nearly sued each other out of existence and the price of sewing machines skyrocketed. They, the price became prohibitively high for many parties. About 50 years after that, the modern bicycle wreaked havoc on entrepreneurs and investors. Today, patent thickets run rampant throughout industry. The smartphone wars, the pharma wars, the mobile network wars, and just recently, the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing wars. These are all costs to society. While patents are an important part of wealth creation, more often than not, they result in conflict and disunion among our brightest innovators. The grand majority of invention remains locked up such that nearly 95% of all patents never become commercially viable. And as we grow a new consensus around aging and death, we must, and I outline this in my notes, we must keep the gates of progress open to all who wish to contribute. So with this mission in mind, uh, my team and I, and I, some of my members, of uh, my team are here today, here, over there. Um, 
we've discovered that machine learning uh, can play an important role in bringing together innovators by showing the relevancy of their work. Our Innovation Explorer has found some promising trends in longevity already, just today. Um, there are over 3,000 patents representing over 7,000 innovators worldwide. We've identified hundreds of organizations. Um, and these organizations predominantly come from higher education, biotechnology, pharmaceuticals, research, hospitals, and healthcare. We're also able to, or, to explore and understand the nature of how these industry players might collaborate across the public and private sector. We're also understanding the innovation landscape by region and already recognize that North America, Europe, and Asia are all making significant strides. This is truly a worldwide effort. Dr. Jun Yoon and I have been working and looking at his portfolio that he's developed in his lifetime, and it truly is a beautiful and significant portfolio for the work in longevity. We found that by running a landscape analysis, there are 24 other assets that closely relate. I think I'm just disclosing this now because the data just came in. This gives us insights into who is investing in this space, the approach they're using for implementing this research, and how this research might translate into therapies we can use. As we look at the innovation timeline, there has been significant growth in activity. Since 2000, there have been an there's been an average growth rate of 8.9%, and just in the past six years alone, an average annual growth rate of 89%. And it's probably even larger than that because in 2016, how the patent system works is it takes 18 months for something to go public um, or publish. So that, that little dot will, will rise when, when those assets publish. And most importantly, what we're realizing is that we must overcome the largest hurdle and the largest expense related to analyzing inventions. It's understanding how they relate to each other as well as how they relate to commercial products. So in this dependency wheel, we've used a deep learning method to pull out and map core concepts and inventions. This is a process that historically has been expensive and extremely time consuming, such that only a few companies have been able to afford this service. Um, and by few, I mean, you know, the top, top companies all do it, but what about everybody else? So tomorrow we see this as being available as a click of the button service. But really, what does all of this mean? Professionally, it means that we can begin to change the way we look at investing and research translation we can reasonably have a great deal of confidence that the science works and we, can both and we both have the intellectual and business resources to bring about change. And now I'm gonna get into something that's a little personal. I'm speaking from my experience as an entrepreneur, investor, and woman. It presents the promise that someday we will no longer have to tell our girls that their reproductive health will degrade at more than twice the rate of their male counterparts. We live in a time where most of us believe that we are created equal. And I have a little photo of that. <laughs> <laughs> but in reality, half of us, meaning half of humankind, lose access to a fundamental part of themselves at the age of 30. It is my deeply held belief that as we make progress in longe longevity research, We'll make progress in social and cultural structures as well. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Nicole Shanahan, uh, attorney and founder of Clear Access IP.